It's only entertainment. Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. My guest today, special guest, Jorge Cervantes. That's the pen name of George Van Patten. He's an American horticulturist, publisher, writer, and he specializes indoor, outdoor, greenhouse cultivation, and medical cannabis. Jorge, thanks for being on The Talking Hedge. Oh, man. Thank you so much. It's um, glad to... Glad to be here, Josh. Gosh, that's uh, that's amazing. We were just talking before I got uh, a little earlier, and uh, we met before. And uh, the, yeah. you're the one person I remember in Tacoma, Tacoma <laughs> yeah. Washington, at the trade fair. Yeah, that you had a a joint rolling machine that would roll like I don't know. It was uh, before they made cigarettes. We talked. I remember the conversation because it was real interesting. Uh, it was about the mo- a lot of it was to get a, a good uh, a good joint that was you had to have the cannabis at the proper moisture level. Mm-hmm. That was that was key to everything the moisture level so it had burned properly because you know most everybody's rolled joints and mm-hmm. that don't burn right or they'll run up one side nobody likes those you like a, like a like a nice clean even and we smoked a bunch of those that's right. I yeah. remember. <laughs> it's about the draw, the humidity, the moisture. Um, all of those things I think are really important for uh, you know joints in particular. Um, what's your yeah. preference right now? I mean, this is the first time I've ever asked anybody in the five years I've been doing this podcast. Uh, first time I've asked this question about personal preferences on indoor or outdoor and uh, favorite cultivars. Like, what's your personal preference? Oh, oh, let's see. Well, I like, I, I've always liked Northern Lights Haze, time, Northern Lights number five times Haze. Uh, that's a real good one. Uh, that's my favorite. Um, and it's hard to get past that, to be honest. There's a lot of new stuff on, on the market, but I, I like the old stuff, actually. Um, I could go on and on, but I, uh, it, it's funny because you think so many people are talk about being connoisseurs and stuff, but really it's a physical trait uh, that they have. You know, I mean, how many, how many, there's like what the less than 300 sommelier uh, wine experts in, in the United States, or maybe that's the world. I don't know. I could look, I should look that up, but um, it's how many um, taste buds you have. How many taste buds you have and how well trained you are uh, and usually people that have really um oh, they fall into like th- th- three gross groups uh one of them is the main group that's where i'm at that's where like 90 95 percent of everybody's at you have like pretty regular tastes and you can tell good from bad sweet from sour you can train that more and then after that, there's a, there's kind of like an in-between group that have a few more taste buds that are more discerning and stuff. And then you've got the super tasters that are right there up on top. Um, so it's kind of like um, people, kind of a misnomer thing. I, I, I mean, I don't mean to burst anybody's bubble, but <laughs> it's kind of like the way it is. And then after you smoke a couple of, couple of hits or something, it's pretty hard to tell the difference, you know. Some people say they can't. I I can't. Um, yeah, I I can't. Uh, and then too, there's a heck of a lot of um, uh, cannabis, well, strains, varieties, cultivars out there. Um, in fact, I was just I'm I'm, I'm a judge this year at the. Uh, what's it called? The uh, Spanx. I'm sorry, I'm a little tired today. It's it's been a long day. Um, Spanibus. It's Spanibus, Spanibus, 2023. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, oh, I'm not supposed to talk about this yet. Okay. <laughs> I'm not supposed to talk Getting about my findings. Well, no, I said I wouldn't. And, and I just, mm-hmm. it, it just seemed like the thing to talk about. So I have to talk about something else, but you guys should come to, oh yeah, here's the, yeah. here's the camera. You guys should come to uh, Spanibus. Anytime you get a chance, it is the, for me, it's the best fair in the world. 
Uh, I haven't been, but I want to go. Um, so I'm bound to get there eventually. But I kind of want to talk about your your own transition because when I first um, heard about you, I started growing 2010 or 2011, and you were still um, in costume, if you will. That's to that <laughs> protect you, right? So yeah, I'm, I, I mean, I'm curious I how mean. cannabis regulations impacted that persona, that Jorge Cervantes's work, or did regulation improve opportunities by allowing George Van Patten to emerge? Oh, it, uh, everybody already knew me as Jorge Cervantes. Mm -hmm. uh, see, I did a whole line of, uh, during those years, it was really difficult, you know, because you had the cannabis books on one side, and then on the other side, you have uh, uh, the, the quote-unquote hydroponic stores. And those guys couldn't sell any straight, they could only sell straight books. In fact, here, I'll put my uh, earphones off and I'll grab one. I didn't think about this that you would ask. Just a second. Oh, I've grabbed a couple of mine, but they're a little bit dirty. I've got, I got these uh, books everywhere. I kid, I kid, I kid. Mine are okay. well used. Here's one. Oh, <laughs> sorry. My earphones are off. Here's one. Um, I've done a lot of books. And here's one. Gardening Indoors. Um, not my favorite cover, but this is the, the last edition of this gardening indoors mm -hmm. so this book here was for the straight market i we had to we had to have two different lives mm -hmm. this yeah. was about tomatoes vegetables annual plants orchids as well come in there i love orchids too um but we could sell this in the straight market uh so we wouldn't get arrested because you got to remember and it was October, it was a Thursday, I forget the first, the, the actual day, it was like the 20th or something, of October 1989, they had Operation Green Merchant. Mm -hmm. And that's when they came and they busted uh, stores in uh, 46 states, I think it was. Mm -hmm. But this one I do remember well, 120 of my friends went to jail. That's what I remember. That's what I remember. Mm -hmm. And they could only sell this book. They would they couldn't sell this 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 Spanish one. But they they um I, I got a lot of different um uh, what do you call it? different languages I put this uh, that I've done. But this book here could be sold, and if you sold this book, or actually be the English one, this book here, mm -hmm. if this was sold uh in your gross store. They could prosecute you under the RICO, racketeering, and ongoing criminal activities. The, the same law that they used to um, uh, in, indict, well, take, take uh, dismantle the, the Italian mafia, and they're trying to use it for other mafias. They also used it on the Hells Angels. Well, they came after us, the peace-loving peace cannabis growers. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was hard times. Yeah. You bet I had to wear a disguise and I'm glad I, glad I had it. There's probably, oh yeah. Here's kind of a character. Where, how do we do this? Here's kind of a character of me in the yeah. disguise. And if you go to my website, marijuanagrowing.com or Jorge-Cervantes.com, uh, you can see pictures of me in a disguise. It's, it's kind of funny. Yeah, I still remember going into those those hydroponic stores when I was growing myself and seeing, you know, signs everywhere that says do not ask us about cannabis and you could kind yep. of hint around and say, "Yeah, hey, I'm looking to grow mushrooms and or or uh, tomatoes or whatever." And they would they knew and they cuz it was even medical and uh, yep. medical cannabis was it was here in Washington state, but you had to tiptoe around that for a long time and yet now we've got a kind of a regulated marketplace and things are are selling but not really selling the things I particularly want. You're a judge at Spanibus. I was just a judge uh, for a cup here in Washington, had 155 samples and all but three of them were, were good, in my opinion. That's a two and a half percent success rate and a 97 and a half percent failure rate. So I'm wondering, yeah. are why are so many growers, from my experience, using plant growth regulators that are producing strains that have no aroma and so they look good on paper, but then when you try it, like no one should be going back and buying that again. Like, why are so many growers <laughs> using that technique? What's your opinion on that? Man, I, I, I what I'm a not, question. 
I'm not sure about that to be uh, perfectly honest. Uh, you know, where you're, where you're getting the cannabis and stuff. I've always been real, I've always had real good dope all the time, man. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I've been fortunate that way, uh, or good cannabis. Um, but what happens, I think a lot of times, well, I know what's happened in the marketplace now. Uh, it's just way too homogeneous. Uh, there's this, uh, like, uh, Kush and, uh, Kush and Kush. Uh, tend to dominate the, the marketplace. Uh, the cannabis grows really quickly. It puts on heavy weight. And uh, people seem to be more interested in money than they are in quality and flavor. Uh, the bag appeal is also a very big issue. How, you know, that it, it's, it's important. It looks nice. That it has lots of resin. It makes a nice photograph. But um, as far as like real quality and stuff, is it possible for <laughs> to scale? Can you scale not, artisanal cannabis? I mean, we've seen people try to scale regulated cannabis, and in my opinion, is not working very well at all. Is it is it even possible to scale cannabis to a point where it's something worth smoking or, or consuming? It's it's really difficult. It's really difficult. I was over. Uh, I went to America this year, and there was. Uh, uh, oh, a friend of mine, uh, uh, Jimmy, the chef, Jimmy uh, Sadich is his name. Anyway, he, he's in Los Alamos, California, and uh, in an agricultural area. He's got, he's, <laughs> he's, he's managing this farm or, or curating, too, the, the varieties for, um, well, gosh, it's the same farm. It's the farm that, 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 uh, that Zorro had for uh, the Walt Disney Zorro. Yeah. <laughs> and it's his farm. It's this old uh, estate. It's really kind of a cool place. Uh, made 18, about, about 1840s, which is pretty darned early, you know, 1840s. That's, that's, um, well, that was quite, quite early for, for that, for a, a place to be established. So it was the only, only place they had the best land, the best setup everywhere you know, for the farm. Um, but he's got about a hundred acres, us acres. It'd be about 40, uh, hectares or hectares. And, uh, most about 85, 90% probably is in raised beds. And he's got the hoop houses over it that you can take the, take the plastic off. You can put shade cloth on and, you know, they're raised bed organic soil. And it, it all looks really, really good. Um, I know they had a heck of a problem with mold this year or, well, it's the rains come and the humidity comes up. Right. So that's uh, for any kind of a farm that's difficult, but to get really high quality, um, uh, beautiful, beautiful flowers, uh, you pretty much need to grow in a smaller area and take, uh, take care of that, put it in a uh, greenhouse or uh, an indoor situation, but that really drives the price up, the production price. Uh, what I believe we're going to see more and more of is, you know, when you talk about the homogeneity of, of stuff and, and the quality, is they're, they're going to um, be making a lot of stuff into concentrates, and they're going to, once you get the concentrated form, then everything's ho homogeneous, you know. Each pound can be different. Each kilogram could be different. And within that kilogram, there could be like major variation, you know, as far as uh, cannabinoid profile. And then you've got all of the, the, the terpenes, you know, I mean, all those things, I mean, they're volatile. They, they, they volatize at, at quite low temperatures. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, you, can, you can destroy those really quickly. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. So if you want to have really good cannabis in a uh, small scale, or I mean, large scale, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be real difficult and it's very labor intensive. And what's happened in today's market, um, uh, money, 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 everything's production cost. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's a big problem because a lot of people are not growing in the most efficient place to grow. Uh, they've got, and, and their, their costs are, are, are out of hand. 
just by the way the market has developed. Uh, say what I, I know Oregon. Uh, I grew up there. I'm not as familiar with with uh, Washington State, but I know they have like one, two, and three tier farms, and a lot of people went out of business. Uh, there's a supply and a demand factor, but the stuff in Oregon, I can I can quote that just I mean in gross figures right off the top of my head. Uh, they've got uh, four million people approximately there, uh, give or take you know hundred thousand or two. And um, so they got that many people, 4 million peop or people there. And uh, then they've got about four times too many dispensaries to serve that crowd or, or that population. And then of that, there's like four times too many growers in relation to dispensaries. So that's even compound stuff. So what's happened is the prices plummeted the 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 cultivation prices plummeted mm -hmm. and then on top of that in oregon and i know in several states and in many provinces in canada they have to uh, uh meet state regulations and stuff and so a lot of most often this cannabis so it'll be bottled up or stored in a government warehouse or in a, a warehouse that's not climate control. And mm -hmm. so it, it, it's like it oxidates uh, or oxidizes, right? It oxidizes and, and uh, basically that turns it brown. You yeah. know? I mean, you want it, you want it fresh and stuff. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of things with this commercial cannabis that really makes you not want to consume it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there, so it, it's it's not just the growers. You can have the growers doing a pretty fair job and taking care of it. But once it, it can go out of their hands, they can't do much about it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, then, my medical provider was was here and then left during the during COVID for another state. And so I was last two, three years, I've been running around trying to find you know, better cultivars and, and brands. And I'm just not finding them. And after testing 155 samples for this Washington cup, realizing that only three were worthwhile, I'm going back to, um, we'll call it medical, uh, and just, you know, basically the, the illicit market, because that's really, um, maybe where people are wow. paying more, more close attention. And I'm wondering yeah. the optimum scenario for home grow for people that are able to grow, um, itself a felony in Washington to grow without a medical card. Um, but I think that's the that's the route because the commercialization has not been working out very well. So when you are building out a home grill, what's the most important factors to consider when setting that up? Oh, boy. Um, I like to grow outdoors because it's uh, underneath the sun and you've got a lot more or a lot fewer problems outdoors. Uh, a lot fewer things you have to be concerned with. Uh, for example, well, here I'm, I'm, I'm live in Barcelona, Spain. I can't really grow a lot here. I, I can grow um, a bit, but uh, you know, I, it's it's tolerated, but so I can't I can't show it, I can't play with it and stuff. But like in in I had a house in California in Sonoma, California, and that's the the Bay Area, or just North Bay Area really. And uh, gosh, I had raised beds, really good uh, organic soil. I I managed that quite well, and uh, what I put. Um, of the uh, hardware cloth underneath so the so the uh, uh, basically uh, moles and I had more moles than anything uh, the the moles but they it's funny because they won't jump over they won't jump over something they always come from underneath so you can always stop them that's always fascinated me but you can do the same for gophers but they're they're a little bit more cagey you know the pocket gophers um, but I would have really good soil, number one, and number two, I'd make it easy to set up a, a cover, the greenhouse, and then I'd also uh, have a good a good horizontal terrace, or I mean, uh, trellis, not terrace, but uh, 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 yeah, and that and that that works really well. Um, protect it from the wind. The wind's really important because the wind will just pull the pull the moisture out of a plant uh, really quickly and it stresses them quite a lot. And then the other thing is to, 
you want to be able to, to keep it within a, a, a pretty steady uh, uh, climate, you know, or I mean a temperature range. Uh, the, te the, the humidity is hard, hard to control, but you can deal with that. You know, uh, usually, uh, uh, well, I mean, it, it, it goes up and down. Uh, what I would use and what I uh, suggest that everybody uses or is activated aerated compost tea because uh, you can uh, brew that up. And I just use a, a, a hose-in sprayer, one of those you can either uh, just put your finger over the little Venturi uh, um, suction button because you, you, you cut that presser, pressure and then it starts pulling, uh, pulling the uh, uh, liquid out of the, uh, or the concentrate out of the, out of the little jar and it mixes with the water at about one to, 15. So you just sling, I mean, literally sling that, spray that all over everything and it just out competes. It out competes uh, all of the, pro all of the problem, uh, bacteria, fungi, uh, insects, uh, everything. It's, it's really quite good. So I would look at all of that basic stuff and then I'd be really concerned with the genetic uh, uh, material that you get uh, mm -hmm. because well, number one, it should it should be disease free. A lot of times, you know, you buy those clones, and they're they're not disease free. See, you can have a powdery mildew, for example, or 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 uh, any any number of things uh, that. Uh, oh, uh, what the? I'm I'm sorry, I got up very early today, and I haven't slept, and this is like my third interview today. Um, so I'm like, yeah. Um, uh, but uh, so I'm, I'm a little forgetful. When you grow uh, outdoors, a lot of has mold on it. Do you need, do you do anything to mitigate the mold? Like, do you spray hypochlorous on or any like natural solution or do you just go at it? Do you worry about the natural molds that develop on an outdoor plant? And that's what the activated aerated compost tea is for. Oh, uh, that oh, will oh, just you spray that everywhere. Gotcha. No, yeah, yeah. yeah, it out competes it. You put it gotcha. everywhere. You put it underneath the leaves, on top of the leaves. Okay. That's why you use the little hose end sprayer. And you can also use one of those, uh, a fogger that that really, that actually atomizes yeah. all everything. And that that goes in and, around, in and around. But if it's outdoors, you can be sloppy with stuff. You mm -hmm. get on the, on the soil. You got to watch the vegetation around the area too. You want to make sure and get plenty of the activated area to compost tea all around because everything within the garden, it, it, it could, you know, they could attack your other plants. Um, so you got to be kind of careful there. Uh, and, and also keep the garden clean, especially around the perimeter so nothing can come in. Uh, make make uh, the same thing I've been saying for forever. Make life difficult for the pests. Mm -hmm. um, that's the main thing. And then as far as uh, mold afterwards, what we use. In fact, I learned this a long time ago over in Humboldt uh, County. My good friend, uh, who was doing it, uh, Joey. Uh, his name is uh, Humboldt local. I think he'll be here at the the uh, span of biz. We got a meeting set up. That'll be good to see him. I haven't seen him for a while. Uh, anyway, yeah, uh, uh, you, you, uh, what I do is, and uh, instructions are in, I think, several of my books. I know it's, I know this book that's in, and then this book as well, the Cannabis Encyclopedia, the structures. Do either of those books, Jorge, have anything in there to help drive down costs for cultivation? Um. How, how can you do it on the cheap, whether you're doing it at home? Because I had to quit growing at home when wholesale prices hit $3. And now I'm kind of coming back full circle to want to grow back at home again, which is a whole nother like normalization uh, moment for me. But when I realized no. it was too expensive, I quit. How do you bring the cost down? Well, the you do it every time you turn around. Uh, let's see. I will open this up to here here's here's a case study i did on my garden <laughs> we're just starting to put this book on my website marijuanagrowing.com i just put the first six chapters today on my website for free 100 mm -hmm. free this book is like 600 pages 
uh, it's actually quite good. It's done, it's done very, very well. And I've also put it in uh, uh, Encyclopedia del Cannabis, the same book, it's a translate to Spanish. So both, both books, the first six chapters, you can find on marijuanagrowing.com, marijuana with a J. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and that was just put up today. It's, it's actually, it's, um, it's been going wild, actually. People really like it. Um, so yeah, the, the, the way to, to drive your costs down is um, spend, kind of a, a funny one. Spend as little money as possible. Uh, <laughs> it's like, don't, don't mean to be a smart ass here, but if you don't have to buy lights and if you don't have to heat a building or heat a room or cool a room, um, it, 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 you, you've just saved a lot of money. Um, if, if you don't have to haul water, see, I mean, a lot of these guys got in a situation where they have to uh, buy a truck and haul water. Other people just open up a gate in a ditch so they don't have to haul water and they're buying the water by the, the acre foot. Right. Mm -hmm. And the other people are buying it by the gallon. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know how many out gallons in an acre foot, but there's a heck of a lot of them. Uh, you know, 50 bucks an acre foot is a pretty good price, I'd say. Um, and the, the other thing is, you know, grow organic soil. Uh, watch where you get your, your, your amendments. Buy them by the truckload. Never, ever buy anything in a plastic bag. I've seen people with a uh, uh, special, oh God, um, I know several hardware stores, several garden centers that made a fortune selling selling uh, bags of dirt to, or bags of soil to uh, uh, growers. But I, I've seen literally semi truckloads pull up with uh, uh, full of soil. You know, one of those 500 gallon uh, big containers that are really, really popular. They, there's a oh, famous picture I did. Uh, anyway, uh, it's got one of those 500 gallon containers. Well, those are really impressive. That takes a whole pallet of soil. Now, I don't know how much in a foot and a half uh, cubic uh, bag there on that soil. That's, that's, that's real expensive. And people, when they're getting, you know, $3,000 U.S. for 454 grams uh, a pound of that stuff, uh, they can do that. Uh, and they can talk about super soil and stuff. But I'll tell you, you know, you go you go into your average nursery that has, say, what, uh, eight, nine hundred different varieties of plants, different variety species of plants. Mm -hmm. And they've got 10 different fertilizers for all of those plants. And then you go into a hydroponic store that grows one plant and you've got <laughs> that many fertilizers, mm -hmm. you know, somebody, somebody's paying too much you know uh you talk to a farmer and you ask him like, well how how do you buy your your uh nutrients he says well i i buy that uh, phosphorus that uh buy that by the truckload <laughs> you know it's like so i buy like uh, or when i was buying that i'm not buying it now but like chicken manure for example you always buy a truckload never buy less than well a, a cubic yard is crazy that's not really enough unless it's small, but, you know, 10 to 20 yards at a time. Uh, and you have a place to put it. Uh, you've got to, you've always got to have a salt meter, especially if you're buying uh, barnyard stuff, uh, salt meter, uh, NA meter to, to measure the amount of uh, salt in it. Uh, see how much you need to leach it out and see what will happen there. Because, I mean, all, all like a lot, a lot of that livestock, they, they feed uh, salt, so they'll put on weight. So especially, mm -hmm. especially steer manure, uh, chicken manure is a lot better. Um, you know, especially if it's, if you can get it out of the barnyard, that's got manure on it and stuff. But if you're, you're, you're buying manure that, that say that, oh gosh, comes out of a hatchery or something, you've got a, or, or, or a production facility, you really got to take a pretty close look at that, but that's where to spend your money, spend your money on a soil test, soil mm -hmm. test, you know? Get a sophisticated soil test. That'll save you thousands in in uh, fertilizer costs. And a lot of the salts too, that's going to limit the uptake, right? And so as soon as people kind of normalize that, um, 
that's even better. Uh, speaking of normalization, I'm wondering when you think growing cannabis will become normalized. My grandparents would grow plants and vegetables and everything, and that was normal. My generation, my, my parents' generation, they don't really um, grow anything anymore. So in recent years, there's been like a shift towards legalization and regulated of cannabis in a lot of jurisdictions. That's going to continue. So more and more countries legalizing and regulating is going to grow uh, and become increasingly more accepted and normalized. So when it's treated similarly to other crops and subjected to the same regulations and standard, that's going to lead to a greater public understanding and acceptance of the plant in a lot of uses. Ultimately, normalization of growing is going to be determined by actions of government and industries, consumers, and how they respond to it. Jorge, what is the point for you to say to yourself, I'll be damned, cannabis is normal? Oh, man, it, um, <laughs> I, I did that a long time ago, about uh, 40 years ago. What, what was it for you? <laughs> up front. Yeah, I mean, that was for me, but um, I've always just loved cannabis and, and pretty much all plants, except those damn things that give you stickers that and that uh, poison <laughs> oak, that poison ivy. I don't like those. A couple of, a couple of others, you know, several weeds, but, you know, you got to deal with those. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, Predicting politics and poli what 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 those guys are going to do, I have no clue. Uh, I, I thought cannabis would be legal, and gosh, uh, what by 19, 19 um, God, about nineteen ninety, I think I, I figured it'd be have to be legal back then. That was 30, 33 years ago. Uh, so I'm a real bad predictor at, at all of that stuff. Um, yeah, and there's all these stigmas and stuff. Um, it, it's whatever is useful. Heck, the you know, I mean, they they reinitiated the war on drugs really, really heavy after the Soviet Union uh, disbanded. And the reason is, that, I mean, according to me, the reason is my opinion is that they had to have a war. American America always wants a war with somebody. They got to have a war going on, you know. Mm -hmm. So they they didn't have that Cold War to go. To, to deal with so they had to turn to somebody else and they found the people that couldn't defend themselves those are the best people to get in a war with and that's us right so they had a big war and then and then the 911 the 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 uh, twin towers uh were attacked in America or in New York and then they had another war now there's a war on terrorism and they just seem to forget about cannabis you know, um, now it's a, a, and then they started, you know, actually releasing information that they had a long time ago. See, I mean, in, back in the seventies, the, uh, the, uh, well, first there was a LaGuardia report and then there was the Schaefer report. And both of those said legalized cannabis and they were official reports by the U S government and they were ignored. So, I mean, I, I mean, who, who, who knows what those guys are going to do? They're going to do what's best to control people. Um, that's it. And, and, you know, with this drug war, they had so many people uh, involved in it. And there were so many people making so much money from a, a legal system. They could confiscate stuff. They could be cowboys. They could go take things from people. Uh, they had the lawyers, the, the, the industrial um, prison complex going and there's a lot of money and it was generating a lot of money and and then also they uh, uh, brainwashed a lot of people and they thought made him think they were doing the right thing who and does a little good and, civil asset forfeiture law or hey come on oh man man yeah I know a lot of people and then they and then they, <laughs> and then, they then they lose their kids too you know okay. that's not fair taking somebody's kids right mm -hmm. and uh, so and they break up homes you know stuff like that and then they all do this to, to, to save, save children. Well, lo and behold, uh, uh, this uh, uh, cannabis, it, 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 uh, it works really well for epilepsy. It works heck really well for, for uh, an, uh, well, a host of different uh, illnesses. Mm -hmm. And it saved a lot of children's lives. It's also uh, given them a lot higher quality of life. Now, the 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 move is well let's tax it let's regulate it and they had to dismantle the entire other system mm -hmm. so you know you could see the hypocrisy there but who in the heck knows what they're going to do 
I have no whether no it's whether clue. it's medicine or whether it's a commodity, it has to come from somewhere, right? And a lot of yeah. the noise I'm hearing is coming out of Colombia. But what about all the money moving into Florida? Do you see places no, like no, Florida just, just making stop, sense? Stop, stop right there. I spent some quite quite some time in Colombia. What what do you hear about Colombia? Oh, incredibly great. I know, I know Colombia. Yes, I know. Yeah, incredibly yeah. great terroir, incredibly low labor rates. And if they get anywhere close to the U.S., it's going to disrupt a lot of farms and, and, uh, and facilities here in North America because of the great product they're able to produce at a low cost. Whereas a lot of money in Florida, where you have high humidity, not really good terroir, not good facilities, high indoor production, they're not going to survive, in my opinion. I'm wondering what you think. Well, a lot of those guys are growing coffee instead of cannabis because they can't get a decent price for it. Mm. Uh, you know, they've highly regulated everything. In Colombia, you can grow up to 20 plants, or they always say 19 to keep it safe, <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, so you can grow uh, uh, some plants, but they don't really have a cannabis culture there. Mm. Uh, there's it's it's starting a bit. There's the big farms, but you know if you the the, the history of Colombia, it's it's been a real violent place, and and they're trying to replace because uh, it's it's been known for uh, coca, uh, coca <laughs> coca leaves, and and then later the pasta. And then that's that's the precursor to to the cocaine powder, and so there's there's been I mean like uh, many many people uh, murdered there many many people a friend of mine was murdered there, um, you know a revolutionary group, it's going to be a volatile place for quite some time, and just to get the country just to get the the cannabis out of the country is very difficult because. Everybody got the handout. They always want, you know, uh, the, the, they're uh, shifting shifting for power all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe they can grow really good cannabis sometimes, you know, other times not. I think it will be more come out of it is, is concentrates because that's where, well, for medicine, for example, that's where you can uh, put it all together. There's quite a few places that are uh, where they want to be uh, entered the, the pharmaceutical market, but it looks like there there there's way too many places growing in the world than there is demand because the demand it it it, it hasn't been um, equalized yet, uh, right. and they can grow. I mean, I don't know. Uh, oh, I, sh I should have figures on this, but. Uh, doesn't take that much land to supply all of the cannabis in all of the United States, like, you know, a couple of two, 3000 acres. And that, that's not too much. And they could grow all of that in the United States. They could grow all of the cannabis they need in, in this country, in Spain with 44 million people, 46, 44 million people in, in a relatively small area. So a lot of stuff's been blown out of proportion. And, you know, some of the soil is really, really good in Colombia. Some of it's not so good. Then you've got Peru right next door. Uh, that's also a, a happening place. You've also got um, uh, Ecuador is, is very close there. And there's a lot of, lot of places. One of the big problems there in the tropics is you've got uh, 12 hours of light all the time. So you have to... You have to <laughs> You have to give it. You have to give it outdoor light. You know, you go up. I, I spend a couple of weeks up there in in Valle de Cauca. It's south of um, uh, Cali. Cali is the biggest city on the west. Well, it's there. There's uh, uh, let's see, Barranquilla, um, uh, Cartagena de las Indias, and then and then uh, Medellin, and then and then Bogota back here. And then on the other side, because see the Andes come up and they split, they split in Colombia. It's got the best geography in the world, man. It's really cool. And then on the other side, on the, the Pacific side, there's uh, the drainage there. Well, uh, a lot of those guys that got into the Colombia are, uh, they, they come out of the mining world, you know. A lot of that ground's polluted too. Uh, a lot of people don't think about that stuff. You just hear these gross things and you got to look at it a little bit closer. 
Uh, you know, so there's there's good things going on in Colombia. Don't don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of political things. There's distances that are quite great uh, to to overcome. There's a lot of lot of obstacles there. Um, you just kind of wrapped up the entire cannabis industry right there in a nutshell with the analogy of Colombia <laughs> and the challenges and roadblocks and barriers and everything that the entire industry needs to kind of work through in order to make it a global uh, industry. Uh, to wrap this up, Jorge, do you see um, anything evolving in the industry as a whole or developments or trends within horticulture? Um, any innovative techniques that are improving yields or quality that you think our listeners should be aware of? Um, yeah, the biggest stuff that I've seen are the the improvements in in genetics and the the ability to study to study uh, genetics and uh, because, like for example, if you take a a, a very uh, a real commercial crop, uh, corn, corn's a major crop, or soybeans, but corn's the best one because it's got the longest history. You look at the breeding curve there, and the improvements that have been made, say in the last twenty years or thirty years, compared to the first entire lifetime of the the ZMIs. You look at all of that, and they they made a lot of improvements. Well, now. It's really cheap to make measurements with cannabis, you know, with, with genetics. You can, and they're, they're uh, finding markers. They're also finding, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're decoding most of the genome of cannabis now. And so it, it can be studied. And it's not going to be people like you know, breeding in their backyard, breeding in their closet and being, you know, like these little gods, people that are poorly educated. Uh, not uh, poorly educated, uh, meaning uh, not nothing. I mean, these guys have done a heck of a good job so far. So far, so good. It's been wonderful. I'm not not uh, putting anybody down, but the the big thing is, uh, it's going to go leaps and bounds much much further. The gene pool with cannabis is pretty darn small. It gets it's like everybody wants Kush, Kush, Kush. Everything tastes like Kush. There's only like uh, a dozen, maybe 20 different base varieties. Um, that, stuff, that stuff's changing, and that's going to be uh, the, biggest, the biggest innovations I see in the future. Interesting. Um, I guess we'll have to wait and see what happens. Um, so, yeah, interesting. All right. Um, well, I think with that, we're going to have to wrap this one up. So I want to thank my guest, Jorge Cervantes, um, he launched a new and improved website. You have to check that out, marijuanagrowing.com. Great resource for all cannabis aficionados interested in growing with higher yields, better cannabis, along with all related products available on marijuanagrowing.com. Jorge is also offering, like he said, the first six chapters of the Cannabis Encyclopedia, which is a definitive guide to medical um, marijuana yeah, cultivation yeah. and consumption, available online for free at the Cannabis Encyclopedia. Well, yeah, that's oh, yeah, so that's far as the, the first six chapters are uh, up there, but I don't know. This thing has got like uh, 20, yeah, 27 chapters. We keep putting them up. So the whole book's going to go up there, both in Spanish and in English. And I've also got two other new books that I've uh, released recently. One's in English. It's called uh, uh, We Grow Cannabis. It's 100 pages, 270 uh, 270 photographs. And when I say a page, it's a real page. It's a page like this. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's like full. It's a great full resource. Text. I've used it myself. I've Nothing grown with like. it. Yeah. I've used it. I recommend it. Check it out. Um, yeah. all of that. And the other stuff. one is Cultivamo Cannabis. It also comes out in Spanish and that one will launch tomorrow. And those are in a PDF format. They've done real well so far and they're free, free, awesome. free, free. Yeah. Good luck at Spanabis. I hope that works out. But I think with that, we're out. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is the Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe or don't. And I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got.